Burlington community. <laughs> Thanks for telling us. New <laughs> Justice Center. Um, I live in Ward 7 and I use she, her pronouns. I think I said all of them. Um, Kim, can when it gets to you, <laughs> when it gets to you, could you hand it off to someone who's joining us virtually? And actually, I'm just going to ask the folks who are on um, video this evening if you want to take part of the introductions, if you could please turn your camera on. Um, if you don't want to, that's absolutely fine. Um, if for some reason you can't get your camera to turn on, put something in the chat so we know that you want to introduce yourself, but we're not seeing you. My name is Mila Grant. I'm city council for the Central District, which is wards two and three, and I use she, her. Hi, everyone. My name is Lauren. I use she, her pronouns, and I am, I messed this up. I'm in the new ward two, um, and I am on the wards two and three steering committee. Um, I'm Roxanne Muse, uh, same as Lauren. I'm in the new ward two and on the wards two and three and the steering committee. Good evening, everybody. My name is Jared Pellerin. I'm with the city attorney's office, and I'm a Ward 5 resident um, here in Burlington. I am Kim Carson. I'm the director of the REIB. And what am I? Uh, the, street? What street? Uh, I'm not telling oh, oh, okay. <laughs> Four. It says four. <laughs> four. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to, well, no one looks like they're on. Yes. Yes. Jess, I'll turn it over to Jess on the camera, on the Hi, Thanks, Kim. Hi, everyone. I'm Jess Hyman. I live in the new Ward 2. I use she, her pronouns. Sorry, I can't be there in person. Food looks delicious. <laughs> and I'll, I'll pass it along to the screen to Colin. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Colin Larson. Uh, he, him. I live in Ward 7. Uh, also, sorry, I couldn't be there in person. Uh, I'm here because we our NPA is in a bit of flux right now, and I want to figure out what to, what we can do about it. Oh, I'm not sorry. I don't know who's next. I think Nancy's hand up is on virtual, so they might want to introduce themselves. Thanks. Um, I'm Nancy Harkins. I couldn't find my chat, so I <laughs> that's why I raised my hand. Um, and for some reason, my camera is not working. Uh, I am in Ward 6, and I live uh, on Hoover Street in the South End, and um, I use she, her pronouns. And um, do we have anybody else online? Looks like Samantha has her hand raised. OK, yeah. Samantha. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Samantha Ayotte. I live uh, on Chase Street in the Old East End, and I'm from so Ward 1, and I use she, her pronouns. Um, and sorry, I'm not able to get my camera working. And also, yeah, uh, similar to Nancy, I don't have a chat up for some reason either. Um, not sure if it's just my browser or not, but um, yeah, happy to be here. So Kevin, Anita, and Nancy, we're going to assume that you want to pass unless you flag us somehow otherwise. And KL. All right, Fosca. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. I'm Fosca. Um, I use share pronouns. I live in Ward 2. Um, I am the new NPA Public Engagement Coordinator. Hi everybody, I'm Scott Rogers. I'm a community development manager with CEDO. I use he, him pronouns. Um, <clears throat> I work with the MPAs to trust community voices on language access, and uh, I live in the shadow of Camel Sun. <laughs> with Ward. <Yeah. laughs> Brian Pine, CEDO director, he, him, and my uh, ward is after 35 years being in Ward 3. I am without moving, I'm now in Ward 2. <laughs> It's a riddle. <laughs> I'm Jonathan Chapel Sogo. I'm um, steering committee in Ward One. He, him. Uh, I'm here because it's all words. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Carol Livingston. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I live in Ward One, and I'm on the steering committee with Sam, um, the 
with Sam Aya and with Jonathan. Um, I've, I've been part of all awards meetings for the past couple of years and I'm sort of floored by what I'm seeing in the room today. So it's pretty amazing to have you all here. Um, I think All Words is a really rich opportunity for us to talk about what we do. I've learned so much from other people. It's like we all are in these silos and do these really cool things at our MPA meetings and then we don't hear about that. And then so these meetings have allowed us to sort of hear what other people do um, and, and really capitalize on that. And um, I also think we're at a pretty crucial time is I think MPAs, it's one of the few places that you don't have to wait two minutes to talk about what you want to say with your counselors, your commissioners. You can say what you want, however long you want, and they, they can talk back to you. Um, we don't have any other place like that besides the NPA meetings. And I think they're really a crucial, crucial um, tool that we need to really capitalize on. So sorry, my lengthy harangue. Charlie G, Charlie Genoni, I live on Rip Street, William, and I'm glad to see that the, the return of the, the All Awards meetings after so many years. Um, we did have like a token All Awards meeting about once a year to talk about the best practices for open meeting laws, how to best facilitate meetings. So hopefully this will signal a return to the All Awards meetings as we used to have years ago. And we look forward to it. Thank you. Um, Ryan Nick, uh, EM pronouns, uh, Ward 8 resident, and I think I and maybe now or about to be the sole uh, steering committee member awarded. So I'm here to learn what that's all about. Good job, Ryan. Thanks. Nice job. Hey, everyone, my name is Lynn Greenberg. I use the pronouns, and I'm on the board. Hi, I'm Lynn Greenberg. I'm the just for the folks and speak up a little bit just because I think it's hard for folks there to hear. So I couldn't really hear you over here. But. Uh, I'm Chris Fryer and Felker. I'm a Ward 3 resident and chairman of the Burlington Republican Party. Uh, I am Jake Schumann. I am a resident of Ward 1. I am not on our NK steering committee. But because of that level of impartiality, I will say that I really like our NPA. It's a good one. <laughs> Mark Barlow, I'm the North District City Councilor. That's wards four and seven. Uh, Sarah Carpenter, she, her. Uh, I'm the Ward Four City Council. I'm Rachel Jolly, she, her. I uh, lead up the Community Justice Center, occasionally asked to facilitate meetings. And um, I, I thought I was in Ward Three, but now Brian Dancer is making me think I'm now in Ward Two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> Um, I think we had somebody join. Jason, there you are. Yeah. Hi there. Uh, sorry I'm late. I thought it was contours and I've been upstairs for 15 minutes. Oh, it will be. And, and thinking, <laughs> it really doesn't seem like it's ever here. I don't know how to stick around and maybe it'll start making sense. And when it started being like this giant rock being driven down the street in LA, I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm looking good at like myself. The symbolism of the rock. <laughs> they got it where it was going. Uh, anyhow, I'm Jason Ed Reich. I'm on the Ward 5 um, NP Steering Committee, and I live on Carolina. Great. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. And I'm really, we, we sat here just because of the hybrid nature. We didn't want to have our back to the camera, but now I'm realizing that everybody can see or hopefully everybody can hear. But if folks are along this side of the table find it problematic, we'll figure out a different way to sit. Um, so we wanted to start with some um, guidelines just to see you all have the guidelines in your packet. I'm not sure about those online. If there's a way to post good, do you think maybe we share the screen and do this as a starting place? So we just had generally I found that community guidelines slash norms slash expectations slash ground rules. Um, it's nice to have something to react to. Um, but we don't see these as set in stone. So we we um, are offering you these as ones to start us out with um, to help kind of give us some baselines of, of um, expectations slash agreements that we're using with each other. But we're also open to hearing either additions or questions about the ones that we have, clarifications if needed. We can read them out 
um, just to make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of elaboration if needed. So in an effort to create a sense of community care, we will strive to listen to understand, remain curious, speak from our own experience using I statements and avoiding generalizations, step up, step back, which is another way of saying share the air, or just be mindful of um, your air time, how much you're speaking, or if you're somebody who tends to not speak very much, maybe speak a little bit, try and make an effort to speak more. Avoid interrupting, practice kindness, respecting differences in identities, pronouns, et cetera. Offer solutions, which framing in the positive as a way to respectfully disagree with something shared. So if you have a point of disagreement, maybe also framing it in the way that you would like to see something you know, um, framed or would like to see it written or proposed. So those are our baselines. Do, does anybody have any additions that they want to add? Or questions about what you see? All right, and we'll see, like, if anybody doesn't feel like they are able to agree with these, please let that be known. And otherwise we'll assume that we're in agreement and we'll move forward with these as our expectations. Great. Um, Rachel and I are kind of uh, big on relationship builders, so we're going to ask you to participate in a relationship builder with us. You don't have to move around or anything. Um, so uh, the one we want to use tonight is uh, three words that those you, who know you would use to describe you. Uh, so I'll start. Um, and... Counselor, I'll pass it this time. So, um, so I, my, I think the words that I would use um, are kindness. I'm, I'm pretty nice. Uh, others would say I'm funny, which is usually a good thing. Um, and I'm incredibly uh, dedicated to the work that I. I'll just do it like if you so choose just do a reminder of your name too because not all of it like without my glasses I can't see some of your name tags across the way so I'm Rachel um and I would say direct is one word organized and um a neat freak I'm not a neat <laughs> uh Sarah um today I'm Patient, try to be cooperative. Probably in some circumstances, I talk too much, and some I don't talk. Mark, um, yes, this is aspirational. <laughs> um, I would say that cooperative is involved. I'm like Rachel, I'm a little bit scattered. Um, I guess I would say helpful, earnest, and at times obnoxious. <laughs> uh, Christopher Helker, I principled, uh, relentless, and arrogant. I've heard that from my mother-in-law before. <laughs> Probably, yeah. Uh, Chris Higgisley, board three, uh, passionate, driven, and uh, I wouldn't be a true Gemini if I wasn't a place. So. <laughs> uh, read. <laughs> uh, friendly. Charming and good looking. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm committed, impatient, and attentive. Uh, Ryan, uh, a couple of good, good ones. Uh, reserved, outdoorsy, funny. So again, I'm Charlie Genoni. I'm from Barry, Vermont. So I came to, to uh, Burlington in the 1980s to attend BBM. I was actually kind of a troublemaker there as a political activist for several years. And ever since then, I've been a, 
a homeowner and a political activist and a community organizer here in Vermont. Thank you. I'm Jason. Uh, adjectives. Um, uh, welcoming. I love to cook for people. Um, kind and discerning. Carol, um, say kind, um, emotional, and well organized. Jonathan, I, I just want to say that I've never, Carol is the nicest. <laughs> nicest. Um, I'm Jonathan, I'm tall, nerdy, and forgetful. <laughs> Brian, um, Passionate, patient, and late. <laughs> Hi, I'm Scott. Uh, empathetic, hardworking, and sometimes tenacious. I uh, have some similar ones. Mufoska, um, she, her. Um, kind, hardworking, and caring. So if anyone joining us virtually want to weigh in on three words those you know would use to describe you. Um, Samantha here. I don't know if anybody else is trying to talk or not. Um, but I would say one, I agree with, uh, Jonathan that Carol is, uh, one of the nicest, one of the nicest people. Um, and, uh, yeah, Jonathan's also tall and tall and nerdy. So that, that checks out too. Um, I would say that people describe me as supportive, um, helpful and funny. Samantha, thank you for confirming um, yeah. Carol and Jonathan's qualities. <laughs> yeah. uh, Nancy, you're next. Go ahead, Nancy. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, Caring, responsible, and proactive. And Jess. Let's see. Um, I think considerate, pragmatic, and a little impatient. Thank you. Uh, last call for anyone on the screen. Okay, thank you so much. Kim, you're up. I would say discerning, sassy, and I recently was told I was a com comedian. <laughs> Stand up. <laughs> Jared, again, um, I think three that I can think of right now, compassionate, driven, and busy. <laughs> um, Roxanne, she, her, um, optimistic, caring, and practical. I'm Lauren, she, her, uh, rational, uh, loyal, and empathetic. Mila, she, her, um, I would say when I talk about things, people would agree that I'm direct. And then some people would think I'm difficult and other people would think I'm truthful. Thank you. Um, I'm going to hand it off to Brian. Okay. Uh, so the um, <coughs> um, oh, yeah. No, yeah. yeah. Where's the agenda item actually? The agenda. We actually, I was wondering, do you had taken it off? It seems, and it, I didn't know if that was on purpose. Yeah, I don't. You know, the last several weeks have been very informal. Um, mm -hmm. So we had had an item on here called the approved the agenda. So this was going to be, we weren't following Robert's rules or uh, do, do, having formalities, but if we just want to go over the agenda and see if anybody has any additions or changes. That would be wonderful. Okay, great. Let's do that. 
So you all, each of you who are in the room have um, an agenda before you, hopefully, and I'm not sure about folks online. Yeah, they should be able to access it through Civic Clerk if you filter in for the all wards, and then you would click the meeting that said November 15th, and then there's the agenda, agenda packet, and the resolution linked. Great. So uh, hopefully those who are in the room and who are on, online have had a chance to look over the agenda. Are there any additions or changes that anybody wants to offer? Yeah, thanks. One small clarification on the last page, it says resolution presented by Jason Van Dreich. I think I'm safe in saying that it's actually presented by the entire Ward 5 steering committee because we work very collaboratively to put this together. It's not um, accurate to portray it just as my slide. I just take thought from uh, <laughs> the uh, agenda the, the, uh, discussion item kind of on the proposed proposal that I believe top there at all is about having it all. They have not had a chance to speak to Tom about that, but they did be folks about it. And, and all the words, what? I'm sorry. And all the words, mayoral debate, they all that have the mayoral candidate tracing through, uh, you know, said, you know, discussion. So I, I put together a proposal for that and feel like it's starting to go into discussion. It would take the remaining 10 minutes. To be, be yeah, there. it seems to fit well, right? Like in the connected community outreach, so we can put it at the end of that, which goes okay. into the spare time for other topics. How does that kind of all work? And then in terms of Jason's edition, I think even though you said that was on the second page, it seems to be on my first page under the city council resolution section. I don't know if you guys are referring to this. I'm saying this. Oh, gotcha. Got it. Thank you. Very bad. Okay. Sorry, it, that's okay. I, I, I did, in fact, I'm the one who sent it, but it's not just from. Yeah, yeah great. I mean, clarification. Any other changes or additions? All right. So we're not going to follow Robert's rules, but if you have, if I, by your silence and no other changes or clarifications, I'm taking that into unanimous approval of this agenda. I appeal to the chair's decision. <laughs> <laughs> Um, moving on, to, so we we are in the city council resolution section, and so that starts out with an update for from our intro of the resolution. Ryan, so I think everyone has it. Hopefully, you've had a chance to see the resolution. It, the origin of the resolution is um, Councillor um, Ben Travers, Ward Five, um, drafted the resolution. It passed the council when it was um, in, when it was debated or. Um, and it was a unanimous approval. Uh, there was some discussion around um, what would be um, sort of the, I mean, I think the next steps are spelled out in the resolution, the intent, um, I think from a high level, if you want like, to hear I, what I think of this is, is really to really reestablish some basic code of conduct within the, the MPAs as being autonomous entities, but yet having at least some basic um, baseline understanding about codes of conduct within NPAs. And um, if anyone from the council who, I don't know, was it sponsored by anyone other than Ben? I forget. I think we all councilors. Oh, all councilors. Oh, okay. The whole council. There you go. So we've got a few councilors here that can talk more about any of their thoughts behind it. But I wanted to at least put it out that the resolution is, um, you know, certainly part of why we convened, not the only reason, but it seemed like a good time, but it was opportunity for focus and discussion um, came out of this process. So are there questions or reactions or comments that people wanted to offer? Um, the provision in here about open meeting law, um, I'm wondering about that from the perspective of, at least in our NPA, we get together about a week before the NPA meeting for a steering committee meeting to plan for the meeting. And you know, it's not like it's secret, but it's not really a public meeting either. It's just a work session to get our act together. And I'm wondering how that intersects with the open meeting provision. Fortunately, we have someone who knows a little bit about this, Jared. Pelton. So planning a meeting, setting an agenda, talking to decide what is going to be on your agenda is not something that has to be done in an open session. And it's not a violation of the open meeting law to have those conversations. Um, you can even share like materials amongst one another that you 
want people to come prepared to discuss or to consider, but you shouldn't be sitting there explaining these things to each other and then engaging in substantive back and forth about a, the, the potential item. Um, but the, the general setting of your agenda and trying to, like you said, gather yourselves to figure out, okay, we're now going to post this agenda and this is what we intend to bring up at the meeting in a week from now is permissible. So Chair, because we all always send the agenda for our for those steering committee meetings to Scott and okay. Scott. Is that required? To post it? To post, yeah. We thought we had to do that as part of the public meeting. Yeah, so you're setting an agenda to talk about an agenda? Like that I don't think is necessary. Okay, yeah. that's good to know. Okay. Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, so, with respect to the open meeting laws, which types of organizations do you want to qualify to? So, the NPAs are part of the city of Burlington. They were born out of resolution from the city council. And so, in that nature of the formation of them and the fact that you guys are taking public business that will then, you know, the, I think the original intention of the NPAs was to provide feedback to our other political entities, whether that's the city council or the mayor. And for that reason, it's always been postured that all the MPAs are um, subject to open meeting law posture. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that the best way to describe the MPA view of the resolution for 80,000 seems to strike me that the organizations are akin to that of an unincorporated association. Unincorporated association? Yeah. An association of private individuals mm -hmm. who have come together for a common purpose, in this case, to advocate on behalf of city governmental issues that are of concern to members of the city. It, I, I think that the city has always taken the position that we provide some form of funding, we have particular staff support, and that it was born, but for the resolution, like in every board, that 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 is the way that it's part of an arm of the, the city itself. Of course, like as Brian has discussed, and I think there has been also, I don't want to misspeak, I'm not in, in tune with the entire history of all of the NPAs, but I think my understanding in, is that they also have some autonomy. They are born out of the wards, the specific locations in which the city is divided based on our census data and di districting, election districting. And so like that autonomy as well, because each ward has its own unique neighborhood feel and thread. And so it's important that they feel like their ward is their own in the way that we have provided support and which we're trying to do here tonight is like, we don't want it to be, it doesn't need to be blanket that every ward NPA acts and operates in the same manner, but there are certain principles, like the open media law being one of them, other things that are important and necessary as entities of um, city government that we abide by and follow. I think that there are some folks who have taken the position that the NPAs are similar to organizations such as the Howard Center, which is a separate legal entity, even in that case, incorporated, uh, that receives funding from the city that's not actually part of the city. And so for the uh, NPAs to be subject to the open meeting law, would necessarily establish that the NPAs would be considered to be part of city government. And I'm not sure that the record of the resolution really supports that. I think that there's some other folks who may have yeah. other opinions as well. Okay. Would you just that may be the case. I think it's important to acknowledge that it's in the city charter that the NPAs were created. So there is actual city action that incorporates them as part of the charter. So I don't think it's accurate to say they're like the Howard Center because the city is not an entity that created the Howard Center. Yeah. But they also receive staff support from the city employee. Funding. Funding. Did you have a question or comment? I do. Thank you. Um, actually, unfortunately, I have like seven. So I'm going to try. <laughs> I'm going to try to compress this. There's some. There's some kind of specific about this. Are we going to go through this line by line, or or is this time for discussion? Specific um, 
we didn't really have a lot of time to go through it line by line, but if you if you want it, if, if you have a line in mind, it really helps that you pull out the line that you want to bring forward. But I didn't imagine going through line by line. Okay, that's perfect. Um, before I do, I, my feeling is, and this you know, this reflects something about what Chris is talking about. It reflects something about the, the Ward One resolution that's in the packet that we probably won't discuss in its specificity. But I think that there's, I think that there's. Um, I think the relationship between the NPAs and the city is, is just a little fuzzy and it's not well articulated anywhere. Um, you know, Jerry, you, you're a lawyer, you can do this, right? Mm -hmm. And you, you could say this is, an, this is this is the city's interpretation of what it is. I don't think that, I don't think that the wards all share a common view of what that relationship is. And so I'm wondering whether we could take as an action to, to put together, you know, maybe it's one representative from each ward, a couple of representatives from the city, and, and actually write down, define the relationship, what, what, what the city can expect from the MPAs, what the MPAs can expect from the city, because then it'll be clear. Then we'll be able to say, oh, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's what we're supposed to do. Right now, it feels like, and, and, and honestly, I was taken, I was, um, among several who were taken by surprise by this resolution. Um, and, and, and I felt bad, you know, it, it upset me. I'm over the upset, but, but uh, it, it shouldn't have to happen. You know, we should, if, if, if I didn't, if I didn't, if I, if I woke up on a Tuesday morning and saw what was passed, I'd say, oh yeah, I understand why the city council could do that because this is our relationship with the city council. As it was, you know, Monday, I felt like, what are they doing? Why are they doing this? So it would really help. I, it would help me a lot. I think it would help others if we could develop, if we can define the relationship clearly. So that's the, kind of my broad question. My specific question has to do with the conflict of interest statement. And I, I completely understand the conflict of interest statement for steering committee members. And, and more than one has one in our bylaws. I don't understand a conflict of interest statement every single member of an MPA. That means every resident of the city has to has to declare and who wants to participate or vote at an MPA meeting has to declare if there's a potential conflict of interest. I kind of think that's that's against the First Amendment. That's undemocratic. I don't get it. People mm -hmm. people come to meetings, people go into voting booths with prejudices and conflicts of interest and they vote. And that's America. That's democracy. I don't really understand asking um, asking every member of a, in a sitting MPA to declare a conflict of interest in a conversation. So I, it would help me if somebody can explain that. Great. So we see a couple of hands up. I do want to, I really appreciate the way you're framing that. We didn't come prepared tonight to make decisions tonight or to um, you know have any action steps by this, but I really appreciate the way you phrased it in terms of generating an action step. We do have note takers. And it sounds like what I heard from that is um, the, the action you're wish, hoping for is to define the relationship between the MPAs and the city, perhaps through something like an MOU, but to allow time for discussion for that in either a future meeting or figuring out a way to bring that action step forward, and also to further discuss the conflict of interest clause part of the resolution. Thank, Thank you. you. I just want to acknowledge that Charlie had his hand up at the top. This is in direct response to, I'm sorry, what's your name? I'm Jonathan. Jonathan. Um, what Jonathan said. Um, just briefly, what what I what kind of came to mind as you were talking is that it's the the memo the the resolution comes across to me as a little bit muddled as to whether it's directed at the steering committees or at the NPA writ large, meaning everybody who lives in a ward and decides to show up, because the 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 purpose it seems is to provide a floor for kind of the governance of the NPAs, but it seems a little odd to apply that to all residents of a ward. So clarifying and separating out what here is about the standards that are expected of the steering committee as the guiding body versus what are the operating principles of the NPA, meaning everybody who shows up and votes would be really useful. I see another hand up on yeah, I just I, I was also curious about the conflict of interest piece, especially given that 
the, the purpose of this resolution, as I understand it, is to move us towards an NPA environment in which more, a more diverse group of people feels more safe more of the time. Does that mean that people of color are not allowed to vote on this because hopefully it affirms a safer space for people who are not white? Like, does that mean, I'm, I'm just not sure how this actually gives us more room. And instead, maybe it makes less space for people to also be people and serve on steering committee and political. So with both of these suggestions, I hear like a lot of generation of content for this further next action step around clarifying where this resolution sits as it in terms of who's the audience and this further clarification about the relationship between MPAs in the city, as well as um, specific parts of the resolution that they want to pick out in terms of the end, meeting the original intent. Yeah. So if you look on, on line 35, I mean, there's a time constraint that steering committees have to come up with language for their for their bylaws, right? So that's the only concern I would have about putting this off um, or how, you know, I hope by the end of this meeting, we have some action steps around establishing a group of people that's gonna make this make these decisions. And, you know, Jason in Ward 5, steering committee came up with some helpful language um, to address these and incorporate in our, our bylaws. Um, but otherwise, we're sort of each on our own trying to figure this out by January. And if I might just address yeah. that, I mean, I think just for everyone's awareness, when the city council put this together um, and then it subsequently passed it, Brian, myself, and Kim did sit down and begin to speak about as staff, like how do we best support the NPAs in meeting this? I think the date. There is a qualifier as January 31st being a shooting target to try to get to, but after each date it says as, or as soon as practicable. So if we get to the 31st of January and it still seems like there's work to be done, there needs to be movement. It's not like that's a hard deadline, okay. but it was, I think that the city council and I can't, can't speak for the body deck, but what I read in the intent of this is that they wanted to put a date there so that there's something to move towards so that we didn't just leave it open-ended forever but there is that opportunity to uh to have space beyond the 31st and i think from the staff's point of view it's nice that we're all here tonight because we want to hear from all of you like how do you envision us each supporting the separate npas in in hopefully getting to meet the the intent of the, of the resolution and it, oh, okay. Sorry, uh, two quick questions. This already passed. This is already in with all these. Okay, good. Um, interesting. Because <laughs> January 31st, that leaves one meeting to make all these bylaw changes because it's Thanksgiving next weekend, Christmas, and Hanukkah holidays, etc. <laughs> it just seems like a tight timeline. And this being my first meeting, I'm not meeting that deadline. <laughs> Especially if you're the only two. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, I guess I get to frame it up, but yeah, like it, it does sound like Jared said that that is an aspirational deadline. Yeah, it just, I'm sorry, I didn't realize that it had already passed. Yeah. There's still quite a few questions to be answered. And based on what we're hearing, one proposal is, as you see at the end of this section on the agenda, a brainstorming mm -hmm. plan to fulfill resolution. We can alter that language to saying maybe we're going to break up into groups to talk about. Um, how you would get one step closer to framing the action, the next action step of what you think needs to happen. Um, so you can help us end the meeting tonight with as clear as it can be around that action step that we, or action steps. Yes, thank you. Colin. Hi, yeah. Um, I, I know there's a question about what aspects of the code of conduct would apply to steering committee members versus um, participants. And I was curious for, you know, city councilors or staff at public meetings for city official city bodies, other official city bodies, what happens when there's a public comment that like broaches this level of, you know, disrespect or something like that? What, what usually occurs? Jared, you're present for a lot of council meetings and public forum. People say what they, they say their piece generally. Speaking. Yeah. Is yeah. So a city council meeting is a, uh, 
limited public forum so that the government opens up this space for public comment and discussion and there can be limitations on that speech um that i don't want i'm not prepared tonight to go into a full like first amendment rundown on all of this but there are also limitations on what what speech can and cannot be controlled as a result of the opening of the public comment um usually it has to be content neutral viewpoint neutral time and manner etc so um but with regard to that i think there's different approaches to how something if something gets to the line of okay if there is you know speech that is unprotected like hate speech or inciting violence or those things i mean it all depends it's situational um as to what comment may or may not be be made um so it's hard to give like an exact definition of what may or may not occur depending on the the situation but i think trying to in the npas if there's uncomfortable conversations versus things that are unlawful or two very different things um and just deciding as community members how you're best going to support each other to be able to have those conversations that may not always be shared viewpoints and people should feel free to come in and, and speak about things and bring their concerns, but doing so in a manner that like is productive. And as we're exercising here tonight, um, hopefully supporting each other to move through that. Okay. We have a little less than 10 minutes left in this Mr. video. Campbell. Oh, sorry. I just had a follow-up question for you. You had mentioned hate speech as not being protected uh, earlier. Can you please provide me your, and the group uh, what the legal definition of hate speech is according to you? I didn't come, I, like I said, I didn't come prepared to give a full <clears throat> definition or go into a First Amendment lecture on, and that's not what I intended to do tonight, but I'm just- Could you give a couple right. of examples of what you would define as Again, I don't. I I would want to make sure that if I'm going to provide guidance to the entire NPAs, that I do make sure I have all my T's crossed and the I's dotted. So I don't. I just. I was just trying to say that there are a number of, from a legal perspective, there's a, a wide spectrum of what is and isn't protected speech, and how you move through that can sometimes be a situational case by case scenario. So it makes it challenging, but um, again, that's what we want to hear from you all. Is like, what can we provide you with support um, to be able to ensure that you are having these conversations and that there is the ability to speak, but if things are not protected and shouldn't be allowed, that those aren't allowed, but everything else that is protected speech is allowed, et cetera. So um, I'm, I'm hearing from you all that I think like, more guidance around that would be beneficial and, and our office can work to to try to provide that <clears throat> make the rounds to the first matter yeah <laughs> we're making note of that as an, another action step oh yeah. actually Claudia, we had um julio um uh, thompson yes from the attorney general's office of the civil rights division yeah, yeah. Come to our NPA and discuss that. So I'm just stuffing that out. It was our human good meeting. So it's great. Yeah, it was a good meeting. Hold up. It's on CCTV on YouTube if yes. anybody wants to catch it. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, Julio would absolutely come back <laughs> to all the NPAs. Did you have a question or comment? Yeah, it seems like you were trying to get pointedly at the, the audio recording. So I'm just curious, like, can I do a quick survey? Like, who in this room has heard, like, the steering committee? recording of like this potentially hate speech that happened at the four or seven and committee. And so Jared, can I like ask really pointedly like back was that hate speech? Your opinion? I I again I didn't come prepared to get into that and I'm not going to to go there this evening with that. And I, I definitely, we, we just want to acknowledge where we are, which is um, we hadn't allowed enough time for this section, knowing that there would be as much, like, in hindsight, knowing that the resolution probably needed more time than we allowed. We just want to get to a decision-making point in terms of the remainder of these things on this section, 
which is the update on the bylaws work from Jared. Um, Kim talking about the REV draft grievance process. Um, obviously, we are in the question speak out time as well. Um, and then the kind of sharing of Ward 5's draft, or maybe re not maybe draft, but the resolution that Jason said on behalf of Ward 5 wanted to share. These are the things that we're also planning to kind of uh, make sure fit in this time. Are people wanting to give this time to talking this out, right, the resolution, knowing that we are going to be having subsequent meetings and we already have a couple of action steps that can be further defined by you in the breakout groups? Or do we want to hear these other three items that were denoted for this time? That are will of the group. So if somebody wants to share more comments tonight about the resolution. Jason, a couple of people do. Maybe we want to err on the side of that airtime and then table some of these others. Does that feel okay? All right. So it's Chris. Yeah. Yeah, and um, then Jason. I don't think that really. Be surprised if I I think there's a number of folks that support the intent behind the resolution. I think the issue, as a number of folks have uh, suggested, is the, the process behind it. And it felt like that the council maybe didn't do their homework on some of these things because, in our bylaws, it was too many. We've already done most of these things, and it kind of feels like this was an issue that needed to be addressed, but it was more of an issue for the New North End that probably should have been addressed at that level. And it, it somehow percolated up to be this whole big citywide thing. And then it comes down, and it's like, but we're already doing these things. Like, well, there's clearly disconnected to John at this point. I think there are a number of folks that, you know, did, had no idea this was coming. I mean, I found out the night before the city council meeting. I had no idea it was coming on the fight. So the process was less than ideal. So is in terms of suggestions for... I think it goes to what Jonathan said about uh, having this MOU type of approach. Okay, thank you. Jason. I very much agree. I mean, I've, I've only been on the steering committee for three, four months, um, but my pretty clear sense is that the relationship between the NPAs and the city is intended to be and generally is a collaborative relationship, one of working together to you know, improve stuff in most general terms. And, and the, 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 the NPAs work to the extent that that collaboration is a two-way street. And yeah, this this is, was clearly very well intended and pointed at some things that was a real issue and needed to be addressed. But I almost wonder if a um, uh, a sort of modified replacement resolution might be in order, where the the NPAs and in particular the folks who've been on the NPAs for a while and really have a deep sense of of how they work best. Can be involved in shaping, you know, this this framework of, of norms and expectations because some of it feels well intentioned but pretty off off base, and I'm not sure an MOU will necessarily fix that because this was intended to be a foundational document, and we need the right foundational document. Um, and then just one other quick thing: there's been a couple of mentions of hate speech. I think that's a pretty unhelpful framing. Um, it's obviously not something we want in any of the NPAs or in, you know, dialogue in the city in general, but when we get to, if we have time for what we put together here, you'll see that it does mention hate speech, and instead what it does is it, it points towards and, and sets an expectation of the, the kinds of, the ways that we expect people to treat each other, and doesn't say, you know, if there is X, the consequence will be Y, because I mean, what hammer do we have? And we would want to use it anyway. But rather to say, we aspire to treat each other well, and here's what this might look like. Thank you. So I heard a proposal potentially, again, affirming that the process is part of the issue in terms of not being consistent with the collaborative nature of the relationship that has been historical. So potentially a modified replacement resolution. Other comments in terms of the Q&A part around the resolution. 
Another um, idea is that we hear a bit about the bylaws, the RAB uh, grievance process, and the Ward 5 resolution to inform whatever more comments, questions, this airtime, and not break out, you know, not going to breakout groups, but share the air as we are doing. Yeah, for sure. Um, forgive me. I never even thought about how a follow up resolution before. I'm not opposed to it. I think it's a great idea. But my question is, counselor, are we able to do that? Or because it's still the same term, is uh, the, the rules, Robert's rules, the parliamentary rules, do they exclude us from being able to have a follow up resolution as for reconsideration? I'm just kind of curious. Oh, Please, good. I'm not a parliamentarian. I'm, t I'm still learning a lot of this stuff, but. Can someone who put the resolution forward ask that it be pulled back and then there would have to be a vote on the council to do that? That's something I have not I have not been confronted with, so I'd have to do some research around pulling a resolution back. I, I think it's past, what I it's past the deadline. And unfortunately, it's the uh, next meeting. Right. The person who okay. voted the affirmative, if it passed, can ask for reconsideration at the next meeting, but that time has already passed. However, what Christopher is asking is, could there be a responding resolution that actually sort of supersedes or addresses this. And I think if it's a new resolution, yes, it doesn't matter that it's the same topic. Yeah, thank you. That's exactly. It has to be substantively different. Yes, exactly. It has to be substantive What? I mean, that's what I've heard. Yeah. Yeah. It can't be anything exactly the same thing. Could that be a follow up? I think that's a follow up item. Thank you. It seems like we're going to need a working group for that. So by kind of in the, uh, with an eye towards education, as we are knowing that like some kind of action items, redrafting proposal, you know, alternative proposals going to be put forward, maybe it would make sense to hear from Jared and Kim and um, Jason around what you were going to be sharing tonight anyway. Jared, is that up? Are you okay to be called on next? Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. I, I think that I pretty much touched upon it, but I, I think when we sat down and as you guys have also brought up, the NPAs across the city do have bylaws and what's included and isn't included in the bylaws is, it varies. I mean, most of them have similar elements, but there are some individual pieces to each bylaw. And I, and I think that that's probably because it, again, as I kind of spoke to earlier, each ward or district having its own fabric and its neighborhood and there's things about it, its particular MPA that feels like it needs to address if it's in its bylaws or not. Um, and so I, di I didn't feel, and I'm speaking with Kim and Brian, that it was appropriate for us to just hand down, well, here, NPAs, these are the things that you need to have in your bylaws specifically. I think the city council has laid out principles that they want to see included. And we wanted to hear from you all, like, how do we best support you in making sure that the bylaws have these certain principles that are laid out in this resolution? And also, if, if as we've heard from some MPAs, they feel they already addressed this and it's included, that we just review that and make sure, okay, it matches up and, and, the, and maybe what's there is more than sufficient and that's wonderful. Um, so really just that we had sat down, we had spent a little bit of time together talking about how do we best support you all. We really knew that we needed to have this chance to hear from you before we took larger steps forward on that. That makes sense. Any questions or comments for Jared about balance? Yeah. Um, I understand that. Uh, I think the other word might be long-winded for me, and I apologize. <laughs> I'm not, I'm never say, never say in like three words that you can say in two sentences. Um, it has to do with <clears throat> it has to do with non-discrimination statements, um, very specifically. And the, the the Ward Five document has one. The, the our bylaws, the Ward One bylaws, have one. The city has one. And it strikes me that if we re if if the relationship is as I think the city thinks of as the relationship between the NPAs and the city, then the NPAs non-discrimination statement should look just like the city's non-discrimination statement. And it should be very easy for everybody to find it on the web page. <laughs> um, so so I, if I can make, make a suggestion that, that um, at, least, at least I would propose to award one, 
that they would that we we should change our our non discrimination policy to be the city's non discrimination policy. But I need to be able to tell them where to find it. I mean, I I found it, but it wasn't easy. Um, Nothing easy it's, on the city's website. <laughs> this should be this should be easy. Yeah. Should be easy. Yeah. And and um, and so when the city changes their non discrimination policy, we should all be changing them, and it should be very easy for that to happen. So that's just a suggestion. Thank you, John. So Kim, are you able to talk on um, what you were going to in terms of the REIV draft grievance process? Sure. <clears throat> it kind of falls in line with uh, what we've been discussing about. It's really talking about doing some research about what we see as far as grievance processes. I think it's um, some of the issue with it is once you've decided a structure, then I can create more of what the process would be. It's also having an independent space to start the process. Um, what we found or what we identified in this process is there's no place for a person to go as a citizen or a member of a steering committee or otherwise, if you felt like you were treated disparagingly in some way or someone violated your rights, to get some kind of guidance or what's next. So basically what this would be is a process once we clarified a few other things of where a person would go to start a process to get some support. And so that's in a nutshell, as with everything else, what you're doing is going to inform what I'm doing. So as we have more clarity and more understanding about who is what and what role people play, it will inform how we go about setting up a process for someone to come and grieve and what that looks like but they're kind of intertwined. Does that make sense? And we also need to understand what role each NPA and what, what your steering rules are to be able to integrate that into each. So it's not something that can come first. It's like the chicken or the egg. We have to have some information for you before we create something and we're not gonna create something without information for you. But that probably sounds convoluted. <laughs> The bottom line is there has to be a process when we talk about equity. I think that people think in general that democracy works and it's good and it's fair. Probably two particular people in this room no. probably don't feel that way. Right. Um, also, when we're talking about representation and changing dynamics, um, there is an assumption that all people are good people and that there is a process and it's easy to ask for help or to say that I've been treated a certain kind of way and to, to always go to people that sometimes look like you or share your experiences, maybe not that. So having a neutral place to do that. The other piece is it's great to have data or to collect information to be able to share with the MPAs about what people say in a way that people don't feel attacked and that you could share data We've gotten X amount of complaints about these things. We can share information without being itemized to a person and, and share information. So I think there's a lot of different ways to go about this, but ultimately it has to be informed by what we come as far as resolution to the structure so that we can match the two things. I heard an underscoring and a highlighting of that collaborative nature that you're hoping to keep up as it's kind of an iterative process that you're going to continue to want information from the MPAs about what you're seeing and what you're hearing and requesting. And then Kim's office is going to also try and be responding with suggestions and ideas or drafts of a policy that you're working on. The other really key piece is the city's not trying to be the person that remediates anything. So we wouldn't be doing a good way to put a disposition on something. Think about conducting, right? So it's a place to take the information and then redirect it wherever it needs to go based off of what is going on in the process and your structures. Is that helpful at all or just yeah, clear as much? Okay. <laughs> In the corner. Oh, sorry. Somewhere sorry. quick, and maybe you want to speak to this, Kim. It's like, I think it's problematic that it says non discrimination because it's like our MPAs shouldn't just not be hating people. <laughs> they should be celebrating and also working to increase the amount of diversity, 
right? So it's like, instead of a negative, don't discriminate, it should be a positive, well, also don't discriminate, but there should be a, a focus on making them more diverse, bringing in diversity, celebrating that diversity. That'd be cool. You want my opinion? Or <laughs> I, 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 I think that's fine. Uh, I mean, I, Yes, right? Yes, and when things happen where people are treated in a certain way, that is what you're trying to remediate. One is quite subjective, right? I wanna be included, I wanna feel belonged, I wanna feel celebrated. That would be in the eye of the beholder. Um, such as also when people feel discriminated against, that is for them to decide and to have a place to go that hopefully is neutral and can, input that information and help it go where it needs to go, right? And there's there's more clarity. What the city is not going to do, and I want to be very clear, is we will not be the arbiters of what is fair and not fair. It's more of, again, the conductor. We need the information to be able to be in a place where it's accessible for people to know where they can go to file, like say, said complaint in a very broad, abstract thing. And then a clear process, procedural fairness, about where it goes and what goes so people understand the process of what you're doing it versus it going to a whole and <laughs> never knowing what's going to happen. And so that's what we're trying to create in collaboration with you all about what that process looks like. So who would be the arbiter then? I think it depends on the thing. And that is part of the process um, of things that are existing, where complaints go in different spaces and places, but this really depends. As we go back to a lot of different things, it's very situational. In this process that your office would be conducting once they receive a complaint from an aggrieved individual, is the process just for the aggrieved individual or is that person and the person that they had conflict with? So, is it both or just focused on the person who feels aggrieved? So, one, I didn't necessarily say it was going to be my office. So okay, sorry. <laughs> one, Presumption we're, we're going to come up. We're going to come up with that process and collaborate with you and and have a conversation behind that. Um, as far as what happens from that, I think it depends on what the thing is, right? And it depends on where the complaint goes, right? So. Let's just say in a hypothetical world, you as your MPA one decides that this is your grievance process. What we are are the housing, maybe, and it comes to us, and then we refer it back to you, to your whomever. It really is about the collaborative process of coming up with what that process is. So we saw Nancy and Colin had their hands up. Sorry that you've been waiting a while. Nancy, go ahead. Hi, um, it, maybe this is jumping ahead, but I, I thought it might uh, inform this discussion. What are we envisioning as far as an implementation of this, of these changes or a communication plan? Because whatever we, def whatever's defined is only gonna be as good as people knowing about it, right? Thank you I for that. That the point, broader, yes, it does. Go, sorry, I, I meant the broader community, not just the uh, the steering committee, but the whole MPA. Yeah, that seems like a very good point for a couple steps down the line. Um, so we'll make note of it for sure in the notes. But it does it kind of includes some uh, things that we've talked about in terms of being a, having a more user friendly website, or in terms of how people are accessing whatever the bylaw resolutions and you know, code of contact conduct would be for the MPA. So your point is a good one around the necessary need for communication. It's only as good as what people know. So let me make note of that. Uh, Colin. Um, yeah, I was, I was, I don't know if this is a good question or not. Um, I just, I don't have a lot of experience with the NPAs, so I'm not too sure. Um, is there a functional difference, you know, with regards to this complaint process between a conflict that would be discriminatory in nature and a conflict that would be, I guess, more interpersonal, you know, someone doesn't like someone else, not because of the protected class, but because they 
don't get along. And then there's acro you know, there's acrimonious interaction as a result of that. Is that something that the city is going to help out with or because it doesn't it's not a discriminatory, you know, situation that's that's something different? I would say we haven't spent much time talking about this together, but we do have a conflict resolution component at the Community Justice Center. If it's that type of conflict, it may be an appropriate answer rather than a process, which is what Kim was just describing. And so, I heard the question more as how do we differentiate between yeah. those? And, and is it a matter of protected classes and definitions or is there other are there other means did i hear your question correctly colin is that what you're trying to get at well yeah and, and i guess to further like should should we have different process for conflict resolution based on the nature of the conflict um and that's literally that's very honestly an open question i don't i don't know i'll defer to you all i have an opinion of course but <laughs> I, I guess, so globally speaking, when you're making a policy about agreements because you want to address certain things, it's not going to be attached to an event. And so I think that what I'm trying to say here to everyone is creating this grievance, even though it came out of this resolution, and the thought is that this was because of something that happened in a particular MPA, for me, from an equity lens, I looked at this as a gap in, do we have a space if someone had a grievance about whatever it is for them to be able to grieve that to a neutral party? So they don't have to go to their steering committee. They can put it someplace and then we can come up with a process to what happens next. Um, I think legally we have to flesh out some more things once we have conversations about what that looks like and what the expectation of um, this body is. And that will inform our next steps. I don't want to get into right now a conversation where we're trying to backdoor talk about the events. Mm -hmm. This is really for me in my office about seeing a need or a um, a space where something doesn't doesn't exist and in common spaces now for something that was created in 1980. We've moved a long way, and so because of that. We want to make sure that people have a place that they can go, no matter what the protected thing is, that they know where they can say, hey, I was made to feel this way or I feel this way, and they can fill out a form or whatever, and there's a process. What that looks like, especially as it relates to the MPAs, is something we have to flush out as a body. So that's kind of the best way. I can and hopefully, like what I've heard from you, Kim, too, is just that that hopefully will provide more options than people feel like they have right now that feel like right. narrow. So we're trying to expand the the scenario of public safety or of of you know kind of what um, grievance can look like from a fairly narrow definition or scenario than than it has been to more options. And I do imagine, Colin, to your question that um, if there was any type of grievance, it would start in one place. So if that's the REIV office, all grievances go there and they sort of get looked at, supported and uh, sorted out at that point. Jason. Um, I think it's really important that we're talking about grievance process and figuring out how to establish that, but um, I just want to put in a plug for um, for the, the bigger picture here, which, as I see it, is that we're all responsible for creating a culture within the NPAs where the need for a grievance process is minimal. Um, and I think it's, again, super important to talk about this, but I don't want to get kind of lost down that hole and forget that 95% of the landscape should be, how do we, in everything we're doing, create a culture of the NPAs where people feel like they can show up, they'll be heard, um, they're, they'll show up and expect to listen, and it's gonna feel like a productive space where everybody can have a piece of it. And then very occasionally it goes off the rails and we need a way to deal with that like you're talking about, but hopefully that's like you know 1%. Of the picture, it's like how you know in Montpelier, 
um, there's a norm there that you could like those crosswalks on State Street, you could be reading a book, drinking a coffee, talking on the phone, cross the street, and you're almost guaranteed you're not going to hit by, by a car because like the norm is everybody comes to a screeching halt whenever there's anybody in a crosswalk. And that's just the culture they've built up there. And, you know, they still have police because probably very occasionally there's some Yahoo who goes down State Street at 40 miles an hour. But I'm sure it's extremely rare because they've done an incredible job with that culture. And I'm, I am I really want to keep my attention focused on that because I'm not good at, the, you know, there's people who know you've clearly done this and have expertise in it and we need it. But my focus is how do we create the space where the need for that is new. Do you want to take the next it's a great segue way to talk you about your sure. document. Sure. I want to say one thing. Yeah, yeah please. Okay. okay. I just want to say, so I've been to many, many hundreds of NPA meetings in Syria. It's way in. And the NPAs have existed for 40 years. And it took 40 years before something happened that brought everybody into this room. So I think the NPAs have done a pretty darn good job for 40 years. So I just wanted to, to basically just point that out. So go ahead. Um, I, I, I have some disagreement with that. I um I think that what happened um was in some cases people just stopped going. They're like, I don't want to deal with this. I've got enough to deal with. This isn't going to be a safe, welcoming space for me, so I'm just not going to go anymore. Um, Your problem. And, and then we had, you know, what happened to me, and every so often I'd be like, I don't know, but then our butterfly counts, I'm doing all this other stuff, police commission, everything, and every so often I'm like, yeah, are we still going to do anything about that, 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 you know? And then this last incident was like, okay, that's it. These people have been so emboldened by what they've been doing to people, it's completely off the rails. Um, but I think in the past when these things have happened uh people would just stop going and just and, and now more people feel better about saying something i felt i feel like i wish i had said more or pushed more but i was as a lot of you know when i visit your npas i'm always talking about public safety issues and that's where i've been really focused on um but uh and it's interesting too because people's lenses are different I had people who who didn't notice, didn't respond to what happened to me. And then I had people who emailed me, was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry I got treated. So people's lenses are, are different. Um, thank, thank you for raising the hand. Great point. Jason, would you like to share what you? Sure. Um, so I want to start just by um, uh, noting that the impetus for this and um, the the first draft of it um, came from um, Farid and Lena. And um, I helped with some tweaks, and then Lena took it back and did more work on it. And other steering committees, uh, steering committee members weighed in. Um, uh, but it really started with these two. So I want to cede the floor for a minute if either of you would like to say anything um, about this. Um. Yep. I, I think <laughs> uh, I want to make sure that like our intention within like creating, I mean, we, we, we heard about like what happened in four and seven and um, I, we, I, you know, obviously like I also know that the NPAs are like autonomous and keeping that in mind, um, we were kind of left with just like, so what can we do as an NPA ourselves, which is we can pass resolutions and for our word. And there's the mechanism for each uh, MPA to inform each other on what, what, what resolutions have been passed. And really like the, the kind of like the way we address the situation is by passing our, uh, well, passing our MPA's resolution, like with, with the statement that Jason uh, and, and Lena and, and the rest uh, worked on, uh, but then also uh, asking, uh, like informing other NPAs. In this, uh, in this case, I reached out to six and like tell them, like, hey, here is the deal. There's a situation. I don't know how much power we have, but we can pass resolutions. I never even thought that the city council would pass their own resolution. This was never the intention from us. I felt like it would be much better if this was something that uh, comes from the bottom up and uh, it comes out organically. That 
sure, like there's like an element of shaming like other NPAs for for like doing that. But I mean, that's kind of like how these things, that's how norms like really get get set, right? And now that's how it changed. So never in like our like uh, you know initial like thought that this was gonna be something that's taken up by the city council and like be like a top down. This is what you guys have to do because that's not that's not what like that's not what the NPAs is. That's not how it works. That's not that's not how it should work. So um, that's like I think like as, as I agree with the content of the resolution that the and the, the city council passed, which is also reflected in our NPAs resolution. It's just the process that I like. I don't think uh, I, I think that would be much better. <laughs> that's my thought. Thank you. Well, I guess I'll just say one one thing briefly. There's there's also accountability, right? We, we don't just have to have the words on the page. We also have to practice them as a community. And I think the the part of this that feels most important to me as a steering committee member and as a member of my community is that we actually work on this together and we believe it and we, and we do it. And I think there's a lot of, there's always a lot of disconnect between the formal governance and the day-to-day -day experience of people in a place. And the NPAs are a really beautiful opportunity to say, we can govern and we live here, this is ours. And so I think the hope for this is that this is an opportunity for us to govern ourselves um, coming from a place of mutual respect. And regardless of, of what happens at the city level, I think it's really spectacular for NPAs to kind of take this up amongst ourselves. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I'll just say a couple of words about process because I think you covered intent really well. Um, our thinking is, well, this 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 resolution is a draft. Um, it was put out in the agenda. Our meeting is tomorrow night, and um, we'll have hopefully a robust discussion on this among hopefully a large set of people who decide to show up and be part of that discussion. Uh, perhaps make some um, amendments based on suggestions from the floor and then vote on this resolution um, at the meeting tomorrow uh, with all who are present. Um, and then that's really the first of two steps because a resolution doesn't have any material effect. It's just, a, at least in an NPA context, it's just a statement of here's what we believe. Um, and what we do want to do coming out of this though is to draft a uh, some sort of bylaw amendment that um, builds the principles of this resolution into the war.5 NPA's bylaws and we haven't really given any thought as a steering committee or as you know a broader NPA as to um, what exactly that will look like but it seems like that's a necessary next step because the resolution basically just sets a direction and the bylaw changes, okay, here's what we're going to do about this in a more structured way from here forward. So that's that's our intent. Um, and if, if this resolution or some modified version of it is of interest to um, any other NPA, um, we freely invite anybody to take it and modify it to fit, you know, what works for um, your NPA and uh, pass, you know, whatever version of it makes sense. But part of what we're hoping is that, um, uh, you know, a, a series of, of parallel and roughly congruent, if not identical statements um, are in themselves powerful because it indicates that people in, in, in the NPAs all over the city are in broad agreement about X. Um, so I don't know if that'll be the case, but that would be a welcome outcome if other folks wanted to pick this up and make it their own. People have questions or comments from any of our Ward 5 representatives here. Yeah. I'll just say thanks you guys for taking this out. Um, you know, it's always good to see when the individual MPAs uh, want to go on the record, whatever the issue may be, and seek to collaborate uh, with the rest of the MPAs uh, about the city, because I think that's kind of what the intent was behind the MPAs. So uh, I just wanted to say thanks for putting the effort in. I know that wordsmithing a resolution can be challenging and 
multiple resolutions and maybe some late night phone calls. Uh, so thanks for doing that. Thank you. I actually have one process question, and maybe we can set this aside, but it goes back to the open meetings question. Steering committee members worked a bunch together on what is something very substantive in order to have something to bring to the NPA meeting for consideration, but it wasn't just you know drafting an agenda, we created a product. Is that a violation of open meeting laws? In this instance, and you and you went back and forth trying to create this. I mean, it also yeah, we had, we had multiple it, drafts in a Google Doc. If you had a quorum of the open of the body present, so I depends on the number of members on your steering committee as well. Um, yeah, all of us were weighing in. Yeah. So in that case, I believe that would have been not not the most appropriate thing to do if the entire steering committee was doing that as a group. Um, so, so that's something I think we need to figure out because I have a suspicion that it's not uncommon for steering committee members to work together on something substantive that then gets brought to the broader NPA for consideration. And if that runs up against open meeting laws, that's kind of a, a monkey wrench in the works of, of getting useful stuff done. And I, I, I don't know what the right answer is there. I'm just flagging a, a cross purposes thing that seems to be significant. Welcome to our world. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but so flagged. Yes. Did you have? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, yeah, you know, and that's again an operating assumption that you know we are a part of the city government. I don't know that I agree with that. I think there are others who share that perspective. But if that were in fact the case, then yeah, I would follow, we would want to follow all the city policies. But I think that. Uh, yeah, I mean, just so fast, like we all do this. We, you know, you know, collaborate, try to form meetings and stuff like that. And, um, you know, it's Here, here's a key difference that might actually be useful the steering committees don't actually have any authority, mm -hmm. the voting mm -hmm. resides with the NPA, mm -hmm. and, and the steering committee is simply we're almost like support staff for the NPA. <laughs> and the voting happens at the end. Yeah. So like, yeah, so it's it we're not doing anything that in any way predetermines the outcome because the outcome by definition of any kind of voting thing is the NPA itself. So I think it's it's almost a, a misapplication of open meeting law to apply it to the steering committee because it's not a decision making body analogous to a city council. Yeah, that makes sense. So you think so you question. I, might, I, I might just take it. That, that's at the risk of screwing everything up. I'm, I like to take it one step further in that the NPAs themselves have no authority. <laughs> there's there's nothing that happens at an NPA that, that has to impact anything in the city. Quite unlike the city council. City council passed a resolution. It's, you know, it's an ordinance. It's a, you know, it goes through a charter change. It's a lie. There's nothing that happens at the NPA that does more than advise advise people. Absolutely nothing. So that's why this feels ambiguous. And clarity would be great. The, what you said is perfect because there is totally nothing that the that the steering committee can do except bring things to the, to the MPA. But even the MPA has no authority. Maybe rather than saying open meeting law, it's, it seems like the underlying principle that we're trying to get at here is that the NPAs themselves are open to everyone. Yes. But that's not the same thing as open meeting law per se. It's more that that anyone who is, you know, who resides in the ward is equally welcome to attend and participate and vote. And the, maybe the, the part that's open meeting law is that, you know, the meetings need to be properly warned and so on and so forth. But at that, that's the more narrow part is we have to get the word out and people get to show up. Okay, so one more hand. And Sorry, I I'll wanna, be quiet now. You're fine. I want to pivot to um, after you. I want to pivot over here to hand the agenda off because Jason gave us another great segue. <laughs> yeah, I just... We could get lost in the sauce on this all night, yeah. um, and I know that we don't all really want to do that. Although maybe some of you over here, but it seems, and I'm so glad, Bosco, that we have you here because there's clearly all of these questions about like where's the where's the line between NPA autonomy and 
NPA authority and jurisdiction and also city jurisdiction. And it seems like we, we all really need a set of guidelines about how we introduce resolutions that make sure that people actually know we're voting on them and people know that we're voting on bylaws so that we can we can be accountable to the communities that we're serving as NPA steering committee members and also maintain that fundamental autonomy from the city, which is part of what makes the NPA so special. So it seems like there's a pretty clear request for that guidance. And then it feels really connected to, to this other resolution from Jonathan, which to me reads as an opportunity to bring the city council a little bit more in line with the NPA, maybe gives the NPAs a little bit more authority, which I think would be really great. So it seems like, you know, the first step we need guidance, and then the second step is that maybe the NPAs should have a little bit more heft, such that we can we can sort of bring we can bring the accountability a little bit more fluidly, like from the community to the NPA and the NPA to the city council. They've all done a great job of really highlighting the foundational conversation and dialogue and decisions that need to be made around 40 years in, what, who are the NPAs and what is the relationship between the city, what power do they have or not have, and so we're definitely making note of that. Uh, frame the next. Uh, so we're going to hand it off to Bosca and to Scott to talk about training and the you need to speak up a little more. Yeah. yeah. Voices get quieter as it gets later. But here it gets a little louder. So actually, um, I do have a thing while they're getting set up to do that. So this has to do with the training of the steering committees. So when you have uh, steering committees that have gone down to zero membership, you get new members on the steering committee. So I don't know what the answer to that question is, that people just self-appoint themselves to steering committees. I don't think that's really in the bylaws. But maybe, uh, maybe other steering committees could just like nominate them or something. You know, it's like, I'm not sure if Colin and Nick here, I'm sorry, Ryan, sorry, Ryan. Ryan. I'm not sure how they get on the steering committee. Yeah, so they're technically not yet on the steering committee, right? All right. Right now, since we don't have any steering committee members for those wards, we need to work with the residents to create a steering committee. And so, to elect someone on the steering committee, like any any NPA, you would vote right at an NPA meeting. So that would happen, um, and people can be appointed. Um, these sit, we worked with city council um, to see if there were volunteers in their ward. So um, obviously, there's going to be a vote and. So for the time being, you're an active string. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't mean to. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah. And everyone's welcome to this meeting, obviously. So, um, welcome. But Charlie raises a great point, which is if there's no one on the steering committee, what do you do? And I think the idea is staff, meaning Fosca and Scott, will work with city councilors to try to get people to come out, put it out through Form Porch Forum, and do a number of outreach methods to reach people to hopefully recruit folks. And then you call the meeting. And then you have a vote, I think is the basic mechanics of it, but Sarah's trying to speak up. And, and I have a suggestion. I I think with my personal opinion that you see though, post should effectively call an NPA meeting, which really just says anybody in the ward come here tonight and we'll talk about it. And so I think that's a step in particularly in the two NPAs where it appears there's no steering committee. So I think my recommendation is that CEDO so call a meeting and say, come here tonight on a night and let's talk about how we get Because really, I think most MPAs elect, you know, you're elected by the body that's present. Yeah. Names are put forward and you'll be elected. But we first have to have the, the group come to a room and have a discussion. And maybe part of the discussion is the mini version of this first. And then I think the members present can nominate themselves or whoever else is willing um, and go for there. Yeah, so I think um, Scott maybe talk a little bit more about this too, but kind of work, as you said, like working with the MPAs themselves to 
create a process and understand how to get people interested and and rebuild a steering committee. So we'll work on calling a meeting um, for what's going on in the meeting. And um, Scott has been working on a process for creating those new steering committee members. Steering committee, um, steering committees. I don't know if you want us to keep going that at all. I can take notes if you wanted to. No, the process is ongoing, so I'll yeah. certainly have some support at a later date. I, I have just a question about like, I mean, it's more of maybe a process question, but how are you going to bootstrap this and who's going to be facilitating? Um, and like in the case, it looks like, you know, Ryan stepped up. He's a kid. He could be basically a committee of one is, do you need a, like, what's a, what's the minimum number that you can have? Um, what if you only have one person interested in the award? What happens? And um, there the problem is yeah. expressed in there somewhere. Uh, so I'm just I'm just trying to like so you know interested parties, but they're not official until you can have enough interested parties to stand up a a committee, or we can say two people can run with it for some period. But our, our bylaws speak to a number. I don't know. Okay. 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 So it's in it's in the bylaws. We have a minimum three or four. Okay. Six. Okay. There's all the previous. MPAs, steering committee members who might have left because they couldn't stand it. And now, like, this is their chance to get back into it. So, and so, yeah, I'm just like saying that until you have that minimum number, um, it would be the role of CEDO to sort of work through that process, or would it be the role of city councilors? Because I know you, uh, Scott, you copied us on email, and we're here tonight because I ended up on this meeting absolutely fascinating, by the way. But um, I don't think it is our, we don't, I don't view it as our role to reconstitute the word 47 and we do, but to help in any way we can. So I guess I'm just trying to understand that before we move What we don't want is city staff to be in the job of recruiting people. That doesn't feel like right. a good, that doesn't feel quite right to be out there. We want the neighbors to recruit. We want, exactly, we want neighbors to recruit neighbors. And so grassroots methods of communication and recruitment is more likely to happen by people who go to the grocery store, who see people at the school or wherever you see people. That's the, the way to bring people in, not through cities. I think we, we could also play some role in that. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's great for so me. That's a great idea. I was thinking that this seems unprecedented and I'm yeah. absolutely new to this table, but it, 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 it needs to be in the bylaws. Like a, a working group needs to decide if, uh, if one of the NPAs collapses, how do we rebuild? We have never had a full uh, yeah. We've never had it right. ever, I don't think. So, which is fine. I and mean, we've had more or less and committed people more or less. So, I don't think that has to slow you down. I think you need to get, particularly the two wards, I think, see us not competing it. I am yeah, setting exactly. a date, setting the yes. time. We'll book the room, we'll do all that stuff. You know, that stuff. And yeah. then it is up to everybody else to like drum up. Go. Can I just throw in something here? Okay, so over the years, what I always used to do is I would follow, I'm not on Facebook, but I would follow Front Porch Forum. I saw somebody make some kind of a comment on Front Porch Forum, or somebody did something interesting. They, they did something, or they said something, or they reacted in a certain way. I would actually email them, and I would say, you know, that was a really interesting thing that you did or said, and would you do you know anything about the NPAs? And so that's how I actually drew several steering committee members over the years. Um, that that to me, so it's kind of an ongoing thing. It's not like oh now we're in a crisis. Now we get so if you just do that ongoing, you don't have these little tiny steering committees, which is what we the problem has been for years now. We had these tiny little steering committees, and especially when you look at the steering committee, you might have five names on it. But if you've only got one person really actively doing the work, so what you need to do is you need to be constantly looking for somebody who's willing to be on that committee and actually do something positive and be an active person. So that's why I always keep my eye out. And I, I probably do that like 10 times a year. I don't have to do it anymore. The work too is stopped <laughs> with active people. So I, you know, I don't have to do it. But basically, when I see someone, even if it's in a different ward, like right now, if I saw someone in Ward 8, especially, or the new Ward 3, or even 4 or 7, 
that's what I would do. I'd say, you know, that was a, you seem to me an interesting person. Do you know anything about the MBAs? And it just naturally over time, you just attract the type of person that you think would be a good person thinking. Yeah, and this is part of why we wanted to talk about this too, is because you know we can't do this on our own and we we need your ideas. Um and that also will fall into kind of the community outreach um section of the agenda. But um I just wanted to say that for this steering committee member trainings, orientation of you, or it's six steering committee members and others have mentioned to me how uh, when they started as a new steering committee member, it's really difficult to understand what their role was, which we kind of touched on earlier, um, as well as, you know, what is expected in terms of meeting minutes or agendas or basic tasks or, you know, does do the steering committee assign roles to each other um, or how that kind of process works. And so I think they thought it would be great to have kind of training orientation when steering committee members begin so that they know what's going on. Um, and so I wanted to open it up for ideas or comments on that. And I see we have people online as well. So if you have any ideas, I want to do a little, a brief brainstorm, but I know we're running a little behind. So we'll try not to go too long. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. Colin seems to have a question already. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, I don't know if this is, happen for anyone else online but we lost the video feed so i can't actually see yeah anything. i came i came here to say the same thing <laughs> oh you lost the video i'm sorry yeah That's oh, there, there we go uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> welcome back samantha um came here, I, yeah i came here to say the same thing but also um fosca you and i had talked about this and i think that um uh you had said something about community outreach and in terms of understanding roles in the MPA and everything. I think, um, yeah, I think training is a good idea. I think that people starting to come into MPAs sort of have a, um, a little bit of responsibility and just like finding brief history of MPAs and kind of just like getting what they're getting into. Um, and I just know um, but I think that, uh, having like a broader training between maybe all wards, um, and maybe even within little steering committee, um, specific steering committee ward, uh, things like how we're getting together on Friday to talk about our, our planning meeting. Um, we can always set aside time specifically in our ward to do that as well. Thank you. I think so we've talked a lot about like defining our relationship with the city and that's something that I hope will be an action that is done uh, but I almost wonder if to supplement the training there's like a general guiding principles document that that's built into that roughly outlines the idea um, but still allows each of the wards to have the autonomy to say oh yes we assign you know Roxanne is always going to be the facilitator and I'm always going to be the note taker um, or say we rotate through or something like that. Yeah, any comments or suggestions? Okay, let me, so let me ask Roxanne and Mark, what <laughs> happens in wards two and three, Chris? What happens in wards two and three when someone expresses interest in joining the wards two or three MPA? What happens? The steering committee. The steering committee, right. Uh, yes, I'm a ward they're from usually. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but we've been trying, we try and meet with them if it's not right. during our regular election process to have the as many steering committee members as possible meet with them and have a dialogue about what it is and what you can bring. So our bylaws provide for the appointment of a steering committee member that would then need to be voted in or uh, elected at the next regularly scheduled NBA meeting. Yeah, the only point I'm trying to make is that, see, they sit down, they actually, when somebody expresses interest in being on the steering committee, they actually invite them to sit down with them and talk about it, about what's involved, why are you interested, this is what we do. So that, 
that is a good model in my opinion. If people, again, you have to have active steering committee members to do that or interested in the MPA to do that. But see, that to me is a good model that they adopt. I, I think from a word standpoint, that's a model of luxury. Um, our, our response, if somebody expresses interest in being on the steering committee, what we usually say is, do you have somebody to nominate you at the next meeting? It's, uh, we'd love to have more people. I don't, I personally, as a, as a steering committee member, have nothing to say about other people who want to be steering committee members. I welcome anybody. So I, I, I don't think, I, I hope you're not doing a ton of vetting about it because it doesn't feel like it's necessary. Within our ward, it's not necessary. It seems like it would be helpful, kind of along the lines of what you're talking about, to have some kind of very basic document that says at a citywide level, here's what being a steering committee member means and here are the basic expectations. Yes. And then each ward can elaborate on that, but like that way, that, that seems like the appropriate level of vetting. Like, you know, here's what the job is. Does this make <laughs> sense to you? You want to do this? this and, and then get into it. But that's just like a really general question as a person that's really new to me. I know we're talking about steering committees, but I would think that that all starts with recruitment of people in general. I'm trying to understand as a brand new person to Burlington, I've lived in two separate communities. If I did, and I'm a person of color, if I did not work for the city, I would not know anything that you're talking about right now. I've never been approached by anyone at a grocery store. I've never been approached by anybody anywhere about participating in an MPA. And this, I'm asking this question, Kim Carson, or four, four, <laughs> four right? I, I literally, as a, I would say, pretty engaging person, have never once been asked by anyone to be a part of an MPA. I've never seen a sign, anything. So as we're talking about this process, as a person that thinks about equity and looking at the dynamics in this room, we're making the assumption that people are that friendly and they're engaging their neighbors and they're doing all these different things. I would have to say, mm, right? And so I'm like, you're, you're talking about building one where I live as well and those kind of things. What really are we doing as far as, and not what the city's doing. I'm talking about my community members, the people I live with. Like, is there like an annual campaign that you do to go door knocking? Like what, what, I hear a lot about deferring to CEDO, but I'm gonna do the other thing as a new person to Burlington. What are the people that wanna be autonomous and don't want us in your business? <laughs> what are you doing? What, what so hold that, on just a second. Yeah. Um, I'm mindful of the time, 928. Yeah. Samantha has oh, sorry, her Samantha. hand up, so sorry. let's go there, and then a couple more things. Thank you. Um, so great, great point. Um, I, so I'm, my partner Joel and I are uh, about a year and a half new to Burlington, and we kind of were nerds, and before we moved here, really dug deep into the history of Burlington and um, and the community aspects that surround this city, and so we kind of came in searching for that and we are very lucky to be have landed in ward one and have some really great resources and uh jonathan and carol and um people like jim Barr and dave collie but um to your point of reaching out to people um fosca and i had talked about this and i think um from what i've heard uh wards two and three have their famous dinners that are are supposed to really bringing in hundreds of people and i think food is extremely important way to bring people in um and i've started cooking for the ward one mpas and i think that especially with people's busy schedules um uh, sometimes a hot topic agenda item is not enough to bring people but if you have a hot topic item and food and you're just like hey i know you've had a really stressful day how about we uh, have some nice hot food, fatten each other up, and then have a nice calm conversation about some things that are rising in the community. So I think that um, 
and just making sure that people know that there is food and especially I like it's free food. So that's, I think that's a like secondary thing, getting as many people in as you can that way, um, I think is really, really important. So we did have um, another business item and Rachel has some follow-up uh, tasks for us. Are we okay with finishing up? I, I think Kim's point is really crucial. Absolutely. And I don't want to lose that one. Well, we, every time we have an all awards meeting, we talk about this. So maybe I can summarize what I've heard so far as the action steps, which definitely includes Kim's great point. Um, one of the first comments we heard was the return to all awards meeting that seemed too irregular, maybe not regular enough. And the, the content of next steps kind of call for maybe perhaps one or more all awards meetings in the near future, because these are the other action items we that I heard. Um, defining the relationship between the NPAs and the city, which may um, need a working group of its own or just one more open session dialogue meeting like this. A resolution and bylaws working group and perhaps a communication and outreach group that perhaps REIB would be present at all three because the, the grievance process that you've talked about, Kim, is crucial as well as um, the equity lens. And I don't want to put this on in the REIB department like this. This is the working groups of the NPAs and CEDO combined. And I, that grievance process, iterative um, process, you know, kind of uh, data influx that you were talking about, Kim, I don't know if you have an opinion on which would be the most pressing working group or if you thought that could include all three, but a resolution working group, a bylaws working group, and maybe a communication outreach working group. Um, the non-discrimination policies of the NPAs related to Kim's um, point um, and Jonathan, I, Jonathan, yeah, um, point in terms of the non-discrimination policies of the NPAs should be almost identical with the city. So that again needs a collaborative process to make sure that we're all, we are on the same page and that CEDO would be needing to call a meeting for wards four and seven to help start the rebuilding and eight, and eight. And eight. And, and what? Eight. Word eight. eight. That's no steering committee except. Thank you. Interested party. Steering committee member elect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. There we go. Did I miss action items? Yeah, correct. Uh, well, I, this just occurred to me and I want to get it in a minute, so I'm just saying now. I'm going to put my colleague Laura on the spot. She's also on the board of elections. Oh. <laughs> Especially voters, right? Yes, I am. So here's an idea I floated, I think it was before you were on the committee, and I did have a preliminary verbal conversation with City Hall, but how about we put a little little card or something anytime someone registers to vote, that they get some kind of confirmation in the mail, or just slip a little NPA thing in when they register to vote, and it says, now you're registered to vote, you can come to the NPA. Well, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would encourage the anticipation. I like this. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll be able to that in the bylaws one. Uh, so the one last piece, uh, uh, someone wanted to talk about uh, a mayoral debate. Yeah, oh, that was me, and one. I like to talk a lot, but it's an interesting time, and everybody else <laughs> uh, just, just say, please read the proposal and see it. I didn't email it, but if you have feedback, give me a holler. My email's on the original chain. And, but I, I just have to clarify, is it Saturday 2.17 or Wednesday 2.14 for the first one? It's supposed to be... Are they both supposed to be Wednesday? Wednesdays. Okay. And those dates were picked. We... Uh, I had a conversation initially with, I got the inspiration from Tom, and then I, I talked to my colleague, Erica, from War 2, and I talked to Jonathan today. And... Um, I have just a very brief process request. We'll call it that. <laughs> which is, um, and, unless I missed it and there already is one, it would be great to have a um, an all awards steering committee Google group. It seems like there's a list of emails that got sent to, but it's much more functional if we actually have um, some sort of Google group or something like that. Um, so is that something that you guys would be willing to set up and add us all to? There was a Google form that Sam set up, Scott, right? There is, yes. Which everyone had access to that was a place to house different, yes. at, well, actually different things that people have done in their MPAs. As a resource for other NPAs. Do you advocate? Right. I will. Yeah. I will figure out how to get access. Great. To that. <laughs> yeah. So I just back up something that Chris said. 
So it was very common four, eight, ten years ago for the MPAs to sponsor a citywide event. And like so the MPAs would sponsor an event in contours or a memorial auditorium or something. And the MPAs would just basically sponsor it. So that was very common at one time. In fact, but we also used to do we used to have like a theme month where all the MPAs would do a certain theme. So the MPAs were more were more united in the past. Now they're kind of isolated. So what Chris is suggesting, we used to do that a lot, and that that practice has also fallen off. So I think it would bring the MPAs out of their isolation. And I think that would be a great idea to do that. Thank you. I've added that too much. <laughs> Were there any other ad action items that you heard tonight that we missed or that you want to add now? I would appoint uh, Empire Center to the Matthews Street Committee to work for it. I don't know she <laughs> Other items. So as, as you go about recruiting people, and if they needed food for like their first meeting, like let me know. Like I, I work for the people's kitchen. We're happy to show up at any NPA and Amazing. provide food. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Thank you. Really great. Great. So we do have a lot of leftover food. We don't have containers, but it feels I don't. We'll, we'll deal with it at City Hall tomorrow, but that just feels kind of stingy. So take what you want. <laughs> take what you want. Put it down. There are some bulls over there. Thank you very much for everybody online and for everybody in the room for gathering tonight. It's really Thank you for great to see you in action. Thank you all.